Good evening and welcome to the Exploratorium and to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. Tonight, we've made it up through element number nine, fluorine. So it's a really interesting element, a very active element. We think you're going to uh, enjoy a lot of the things that we can show you tonight. Um, I hope everybody here has their collectible card, their fluorine card. Yay, okay. And if you want, I believe if you have missed it, uh, I don't know whether we should be giving away, I think you should have to attend these to get the cards, but on the table over there, there are the other cards for fill-in if you want to go and get the other collectible cards as well. I'm just curious, how many people are here from the uh, AGU meeting today, the American Geophysical Union? Only one person, all right, yeah. It was a wonderful thing, I went to it, it was there uh, Tuesday. Great, great, great meeting. So, um, how many people have the previous cards? Just how many element groupies do we have here tonight? <laughs> All right, so we have a good number of, of element groupies. That's very good. <coughs> I'm one of them myself, of course. I collected elements when I was in high school. Yes, some people collect stamps, some people collect coins. I collected elements. Had a pretty good collection, too. I didn't have any of tonight's element, however, because I ha don't have a death wish. So. Uh, Tonight, we're going to do fluorine. Uh, for the first half, I'm going to talk. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. <coughs> and the second half, we're going to talk with, we're going to have a talk by Howard Pollack, and I'm going to read his qualifications here. He is a clinical professor in the Department of Preventative and Restorative Dental Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. And he's going to talk about fluoride being added uh, as an additive to most toothpaste as well as our public water supply, which is really a fact that's interesting. It's attacked by many conspiracy theorists. So uh, we will uh, get to that in the second half. Tonight, I just want to start here, and we're going to talk about fluorine. Uh, the introductory graphic here, actually, you see a little, just a little vial, and inside of there, there probably was some fluorine, and, uh, it, but it's so active that it probably has eaten into the glass, and there's no actual fluorine in that bottle right now. Uh, the fluorine is element number nine, right up there at the top, near the top row, uh, right next to neon. Nine, meaning nine protons in the nucleus, <coughs> and it has an atomic weight of about 19, which means that there's nine protons in the nucleus and 10 neutrons in the nucleus. So it has the chemical symbol of F, not FL. FL is actually given to one of those ones down at the bottom of the table, one of the new elements that has been synthesized recently. Um, it was... Um, it has an interesting history, fluorine, because it's such an active and dangerous element. Uh, we can sort of start with this guy, uh, Georges Agricola. Now, he actually didn't discover fluorine, but he took this uh, element, this uh, mineral, fluorite, which you can see some samples here on the table, and he discovered that if you add this to uh, your smelting furnace, that the metal melted at a much lower temperature. So he discovered this fluorine compound here, and these are a, a good collection here of natural forms of uh, fluorine. So he, again, he discovered that smelting, it actually helped in that process. Uh, he coined the term uh, fluorus, which from fluo meaning flow, because it caused the metal to flow much more easily. And that's where we get our word fluorine. Uh, again, that mineral that he used was fluorite. I just thought put up a big piece of it here so you can see it. It's a beautiful cubic crystal. Uh, comes in many different colors and uh, it's uh, one of the main forms of fluorine that you can find here on the earth. Uh, because fluorine is so active, there is no free fluorine in our atmosphere or in the earth. It's all in compounds and mostly in the form of fluorite. So if you move a little bit uh, into the discovery of fluorine, before it was actually freed as an element itself, a free element, we have this fellow here, and I have to read his name, it's Andreas Sigismund Margraf, and he actually uh, synthesized uh, hydrofluoric acid, which is a hydrogen atom and a fluorine atom together. Hydrogen, hydrofluoric acid is an extremely um, active acid, probably the, the most active acid around, and uh, it uh, can be used for lots of things that we'll talk about in just a bit. Uh, he did this in 1764, and he did that by heating 
good old fluorite uh, with sulfuric acid in glass. And we did this in glass. The, he formed hydrofluoric acid, and hydrofluoric acid is so active, it eats glass. So the glass became frosted. So we knew he had some very, very, very active uh, substance inside that uh, glass container. Fluorine was first actually freed as an element by this guy, um, Henri Mosson, and uh, he, that's his apparatus for doing it there. He had to uh, uh, do all kinds of things to get it to work uh, because it eats everything. He d had to do it by electrolysis, taking a substance and putting a, two electrodes, one positive and one negative, and the fluorine would uh, come out on the, uh, let me think about this, on the negative, no, the positive electrode, I believe. I have to think about that one for a while. But anyway, he was able to free actual fluorine, but the problem with that is it eats everything, and so he actually had to store it in, uh, it, ate, it even eats platinum, uh, so he had to store it in s different kinds of containers with fluorite using this, since this already has fluorine in it. The fluorite, you can use fluorite stoppers and fluorite containers. Um, the discovery of fluorine, this was sort of the last step, but before uh, Henri here, there were a lot of uh, folks who tried to free fluorine from uh, its substances and they, the results they got were a little disastrous and these people are all called the fluorine martyrs. A lot of chemists were involved here and uh, some of them, although some of them didn't actually kill themselves, these three guys for instance, uh, Gay Lussac, uh, uh, Louis Jacques Fenard, Sir Humphrey Davy, they were able to free some uh, fluorine and they did suffer for it. Um, uh, Sir Humphrey Davy actually uh, probably ruined his eyes with it. Uh, uh, so again, some of the martyrs of fluorine. Uh, these guys I don't even have a picture of, Thomas and George Knox. Uh, they uh, developed a fluorite apparatus uh, for working with hydrogen fluoride, that, uh, that acid. Uh, but even though they, they were using some allegedly safe things, they were severely poisoned. Thomas nearly died and George uh, was an invalid for three years. So this stuff is really nasty stuff. These guys right here, uh, uh, they actually uh, freed up some fluorine and these were true martyrs. These guys died from their discovery. So this has uh, been a history of, uh, of kind of tragic discovery. So we move now a little bit into what fluorine is really like. Fluorine is really interesting. If we look at the size of the atom, it's actually smaller than hydrogen because the fluorine atom has uh, uh, charges in its nucleus. It has uh, uh, nine protons and it has uh, nine electrons. Those electrons are held very, very closely in and it's actually a, a very, very small atom. Uh, it has a, a, a density that's uh, interesting. Uh, the density of the gas is about uh, 1.6 grams per liter. The density of the liquid is one and a half, uh, sorry, about one and a half kilograms per liter, which is one and a half times as dense as water. So it's really a dense liquid. Um, but that liquid also has to be kind of cold at minus 188 degrees. Uh, if you remember correctly, the density of water is about one kilogram per liter. And there's a bunch of, here's a bunch of other densities. If you want to see gasoline, for instance, is less dense than water, so it floats. And the most heavy, the heaviest element is uh, much heavier. It's uh, osmium. That's the heaviest element at 22,000 grams per liter or 22 kilograms per uh, liter. It's a very, very heavy element. Uh, I don't think we'll have that here when we actually make it to osmium in the next, I think, probably eight years from now. Uh, because it's very expensive as well and extremely poisonous in its oxide forms. Uh, in the abundance column, uh, it's about 400 parts per billion of the universe, which is actually the 24th most abundant element. Um, and about 50 parts per million of the sun and the 600 parts per million on the Earth's crust, most of it in the form of fluorite. And again, we can talk about this 0% in the Earth's atmosphere because it's all a compound within the crust of the Earth. Um, it's a little bit of the Earth's oceans and a little bit of your body. Actually, I think that number is off by a factor of 10, but oh well. Fluorine's interesting. It's not made in stars like our sun. It's only made in very, very large stars. It doesn't really take pl uh, part in the nuclear process. It's a product of very large stars, supernovas, and, and very large stars. So uh, fluorine is a, you can see it's a green square. We're getting to the first of the green squares now. Uh, and uh, that things have to be made in large stars and supernovae, or artificially made. Uh, 
If we look at the periodic table, the periodic table is arranged in these columns, and the columns in the periodic table have um, similar properties. And a lot of, we're familiar with this last column, it's helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. Um, I think that's the right order. Uh, and they, those are the noble, the, the noble gases. The noble gases have all of their electron shells full. They don't want to donate electrons to anything. They don't want to borrow electrons from any element. And so they are happy and content just to sit out all by themselves, their noble selves. Uh, helium there, we can see helium has two electrons that completely fill its inner shell. The, the only shell, actually, that helium has. Uh, we move on to neon, next month's element. And it has the same two electrons in the inner shell and eight electrons in the next shell out. And if we move on to argon, then we add another eight electrons in the shell outside of that. And again, fully, fully populated shells. They don't want to participate in any chemistry at all. If we move to the other side of the periodic table, there we have some interesting elements, which we will talk about, one of which we'll talk about in two months, sodium. And those elements have, um, are called the alkali metals. And they have a different kind of electronic structure. If you look, for instance, at the first one, lithium, which we talked about a few months ago. Uh, lithium has that first shell full, but the second shell only has one electron. It has an electron it really doesn't like having. It'd like to get rid of that electron so it can look like helium. Neon, similarly, has two electrons in the inner shell, and the next shell is full with eight, and the next shell, just one. It'd like to get rid of that, and so that sodium can look like neon. Uh, potassium, similarly, would like to look like um, the next element down, argon. These would love to react with something and get rid of that electron. So these are very reactive, and we're gonna get to one of those in two months. Next month is neon, and then the month after that's going to be sodium. Now we finally get to the column we're in tonight. This column here, which is ca they're called the halogens, and this column here, unlike the first column of the alkali metals, these don't have one extra electron in their outer shells. These have one missing electron in their outer shells. They would like desperately to steal an electron from something, to bond with something and, and borrow that electron. And so here we have, for instance, the first one, fluorine, that's the top one in the table. And it has two electrons in its inner shell and seven. It wants to have eight in that outer shell. Moving down the chart, chlorine has two and eight and seven. It would like to have eight. And iodine, two, eight. Oh, it should be an eight and then 18 and then it's almost full, it needs one electron in that outer shell. These guys do not, these guys love to react and fluorine likes to react the most of all of them because its electrons, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> its electrons are held closest to its nucleus and therefore most, most tightly. <coughs> As you move down the periodic table, those halogens become less and less reactive. So fluorine is the most reactive of all the halogens. If you look, this is a chart that they have put a, uh, a circle, and the size of that circle, this is called the electron affinity, <coughs> and that's how much energy is released when you add an extra electron to each one of these elements. And you can see, I'll use my magic wand pointer here, you can see that the halogen column right here, you get a lot of energy out by adding the electron, the last remaining electron that it wants into its atom. All the others are not quite as active. Electro the, another way of looking at it is in this next slide, which is not done a little bit differently. This is called the electronegativity, and that's a chemical property that describes the tendency of an atom to attract electrons towards itself. Well, I have a blue line there that's marking fluorine, and you notice that fluorine is the most electronegative element that there is. It most desperately wants to attain one more electron. This is sort of arranged the horizontal axis as you, gain, as you move up through the table, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, and so on through the table. And the vertical axis is how much it wants that extra electron. So the fluorine molecule Actually, it's, uh, as it exists, is a diatomic molecule. There's two atoms together. Um, and those two atoms actually bond fairly weakly. And they bond by sharing an electron. So here we have two 
independent fluorine atoms, and you can see the inner shell has two and the outer shell has seven. And they want, to bo they want that extra electron so bad that you can sort of get them together. And now each electron kind of has eight electrons in its outer shell. So the fluorine molecule kind of makes it so that each one they share an electron with each other, F2. That's how it appears in nature. Now I mentioned that uh, fluorine gas has a, a fairly high density actually, but the uh, Royal Institute has a wonderful series of videos up on the web, by the way, which you should all go and watch because uh, it has this crazy chemist with this wild hair, which I don't know if any of you have seen him. He's great. But uh, I stole a couple pieces from their video. Here, they've actually uh, run some fluorine into a Teflon tube, we'll get to Teflon, inside of a liquid nitrogen thermos. And there you can see at the bottom there, that yellowish liquid, that is actually the liquid fluorine. Something that is really, you would, this is actually kind of special to be able to see this. Fluorine gas, if you collected it, would be kind of a yellowish gas, but you'd have to have a pretty thick layer of it to see the yellowishness of it. Um, it's again extremely reactive, and I'll use uh, the videos from the Royal Institute here and show you. Here they're going to put fluorine gas, and they're going to put a little jet of fluorine gas through a piece of steel wool. <coughs> now you think it's just catching the whole thing on fire there. <coughs> but what they're going to do now is they're going to give you a little view at the end. Notice it just blew a hole right through the steel wool. Very energetic reaction. You think, well, that, that was kind of hot gas. Well, it actually wasn't hot gas. It was cold fluorine gas. Here, they're going to shoot some cold fluorine gas onto some cold charcoal. These charcoal, these briquettes are not lit. And, but just the contact with fluorine causes the chemical reaction and releases enough energy to actually ca catch them on fire. And we all know that Briquettes are the least flammable things known to mankind. <laughs> it's true. I showed you last month. You, you probably saw the, the uh, lighting them with liquid oxygen, right? And they, the barbecue disappeared, but the briquettes were still sitting there. <laughs> if your house is on fire, throw briquettes on your house. <laughs> Here's a few more just for fun. This is um, fluorine and cotton. Immediately catches fire. The next one's interesting is, um, this is iodine. Notice the smoke from iodine is purple. Iodine is in the same column as, as fluorine, and yet fluorine reacts with the same, they both want an electron, but fluorine wants it more. I mean, the, yeah, here's the sulfur. I just like burning, seeing things burn. <laughs> Fourth of July is my high holy day. So there's cold fluorine hitting a cold piece of sulfur. Now I mentioned that uh, when you combine fluorine and hydrogen, you get this hydrogen fluoride or hydrofluoric acid, and it's used industrially quite, uh, quite a bit. Here, an artist has used it to etch glass. It causes glass to be eaten away. And so this artist um, has used it to uh, etch art pieces. Again, you have to be very, very careful with a lot of protection to use uh, hydrofluoric acid because it can actually get into you just if, if it touches your fingers. It doesn't just burn you, it gets into your body and can cause serious, serious damage. Um, fluorine is also present in, of course, toothpaste. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that because our next speaker is going to talk about that. So I'm just going to skip over that. Another interesting use of uh, Fluorine was to create a series of substances, fluorinated hydrocarbons, or uh, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, and here's one of, one of the first ones made, dichlorodifluoromethane. This uh, is uh, an element, when you start putting, when you combine fluorine with things, since fluorine is so active, once it's combined with things, it becomes very inactive. Whatever the result is, is an extremely inert substance. So this is a very inert substance, and it has a low, um, 
liquid, it has a low boiling point, uh, and so this also works well as a refrigerant. And so this is what was in air conditioners and refrigerators up until the uh, 90s, in which, after which this particular uh, form of it was banned because it was uh, causing our ozone layer to go away. I'll talk about that in a moment. It was also used as a propellant in uh, spray paint and things like silly string. But that was all put to an end because this stuff caused the ozone in the Antarctic to sort of go away. So here you see the ozone hole forming this year. It comes quite large, about the size of the US. But good news, since we've banned the use of CFCs, or the, the really bad ones anyway, um, the ozone hole has actually started to shrink again and may actually uh, be gone by the 2040s-ish. So good news on that. We actually can have an effect. I just want to tell an interesting story. The guy who invented CFCs was a, probably the most unlucky chemist ever to live. It's this guy here, Thomas <coughs> Migley Jr. And he invented a lot of things. He worked. Uh, the first thing he invented, actually, he, the stuff he invented was so damaging to our environment and the population, it wasn't his fault. I mean, at the time, it, they were good things. But in retrospect, this poor guy caused more damage to humans on the earth probably than any chemist ever known. The first thing he did was actually put lead in gasoline because it caused the engine to stop knocking, which then polluted virtually everything and caused all these lead poisonings that we, we think may have caused problems with, uh, with our uh, learning abilities. Uh, so that was his, that was his responsibility, <clears throat> but it was a good thing back then. He also invented the CFCs, which destroyed the ozone hole. Again, back then, we didn't know that. So uh, again, sort of bad luck in retrospect. Um, he also contracted uh, polio at uh, a somewhat of a young age. So he invented a series of pulleys and, and, and ropes that would help people get him out of bed. Unfortunately, this invention did him in because he was strangled by his own invention. So that's gotta be the most unlucky person I have ever heard. Oh well. <clears throat> Accidentally, uh, Something that was invented was this stuff, polytetrafluoroethylene. <coughs> this we all know as Teflon. Uh, this was an accidental discovery. It was fluorine in a container and there was a white powder on the inside of the container that was slippery and inert because once fluorine combines with something, it's, it's pretty inert. And here you can see that it's just a chain of these black, or in this case, gray carbon uh, atoms with uh, groups of two Fluorine atoms kind of off to the side, long chains. So uh, that is uh, polytetrafluoroethylene, brand name, Teflon by DuPont. And of course, we know it because we all use, have it in our, in our fr frying pans. It keeps, it's inert. It's uh, fairly, uh, you don't want to heat it up too much, but on a stove, you can't really do too much damage. Um, and it'll keep things from sticking. It's very inert. It's also slippery. I love the, the ad there. It's an amazing new concept in cooking. Nothing sticks to the happy pan. In chemistry, it's also useful since it's so inert, you can actually keep very, very powerful chemicals in it or uh, in this case, it's used as a stopcock for a, a burette. Uh, and uh, it's, since it's inert, you can put all kinds of nasty stuff in there. Uh, it's also part of the material, the purple material there is Gore-Tex. That is a Teflon coated material. So it sheds water and it's, uh, it's uh, inert to a lot of things. And the, uh, there's a suture over there that's also made out of uh, Teflon or at least coated with Teflon. And I'm not sure why you would coat a, t a suture with Teflon. Um, maybe our speaker can tell us, uh, maybe Dr. Pollock can tell, uh, clue us in on that. Uh, although I, you're, not an or you're not an oral surgeon, are you? Oh, he does sew people up. Okay, but you don't use this stuff? Oh, okay, too bad. Well, we can all go, Google is your friend, right? Okay, we can look it up. So that's all I really have tonight. Uh, I want to, uh, we'll do a little changeover here. Thank you for coming to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. We'll do a little changeover and Dr. Pollock will come up and we'll talk about dentistry and fluoride, fluoridated water. Thank you.